Greetings to everyone at the Secure ID World Conference from the U.S. Department of Homeland Security in Washington, D.C. I'm Kathy Craninger. I'm the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Policy Screening Coordination at DHS. And I'm here to cover a little bit about where we're going with our screening programs. Very specifically, I know that Stuart Baker has talked to you about what the department's vision is for this. Uh, identification is really core to how we assess an individual who has presented themselves. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the key program areas and where we've been going with that. First and foremost, we can talk about how we process people into the country. And there have been some dramatic improvements in recent years in that area, and we expect to continue to improve that. And it really is part of an international conversation as well that we've been having with our colleagues across the world on interdicting terrorist travel and continuing to enhance the security of the transportation system and the international travel system writ large. First off, I can talk a little bit about the visa waiver program. We have made enhancements to that. We have agreements with many of our counterparts with respect to sharing of terrorist information, criminal information, lost and stolen passport information, all of those things are critical to the program and to, again, having a little bit of information in advance of someone coming to the U.S. to know uh, whether or not they're a concern. Another core to that is the new electronic system for travel authorization, the ESTA program. We are excited to be already in compliance uh, in that program. As of January 12th, 2009, all travelers under the visa waiver program, that includes the 27 countries that were members up until recently and, and remain members, and that includes the new nations that we have brought on board to that program. They have to have an ESTA that they get online in advance of coming to the United States. And it provides just the same information that we had from them through their paper I-94, but again, we get that in advance online. Um, that's been a huge improvement. We expect to really push out on electronic information and advance information as we have been all along, and ESTA is uh, very much a part of that whole continuum. We have made big strides in terms of biometrics. We have the transition to collection of 10 fingerprints from everyone who is applying for a visa that continues through to their entry into the United States. If you have already obviously obtained a visa, we have 10 prints on you, and we're doing a very quick verification at the port of entry. If you're traveling under the visa waiver program, or had entered previously under other, the previous program of collection of two fingerprints, we're collecting 10 at the port of entry. And all of these things are the ability to better identify you, to ensure that we process you very effectively and efficiently uh, if you are a legitimate traveler into the United States, and then to identify someone who perhaps poses a risk. It is tied to our ability to share data on individuals of interest with foreign national partners, as we've, we've done in a number of arenas, so that we're able to take a latent print taken from the theater, the war, the war theater, and match that against the information that we have on peel, people entering the United States. Uh, many of us are, many have, um, many countries, I should say, many of our partners have shared that kind of information with us as we share it with them. So again, we have the opportunity to interdict people who are really seeking to do harm. Um, that's a lot about what's happening at our airports of entry. We have a major program, obviously, that we are in execution of the Western Hemisphere Travel Initiative. And that is about the U.S. land borders and our cooperation with our Canadian counterparts, certainly um, the interest with our Mexican counterparts as well, to make sure that people are identifying themselves when they enter the country. Up until last year, U.S. citizens and Canadian nationals could enter the U.S. without providing documentation of their identification or their citizenship. It was a mere oral declaration of that. And so we are now moving to secure documents that actually are going to be verified at the port of entry. We've deployed radio frequency identification antenna and new software improvements so that a CBP officer, uh, our Customs and Border Protection officer at the border can look at the key identifying information on a person and their photograph 
as they're approaching the booth. And so that information's pulled up. They can quickly and efficiently process the people who are in the car, multiple people at once, and, and move them through and otherwise interdict an individual, again, who is of concern or who we, we know about. So that's a very exciting program. We are in deployment. We have um, more than 150 lanes completed of our about 400 lanes completed. And so that's a, a huge step forward. June 2009 is the beginning of enforcement and compliance for the secure identification requirement under WHTI. And the last thing worth talking about is really a lot of the um, internal actions that are happening within the United States. Identification for individuals who have access to critical infrastructure. We have made major strides with the Transportation Worker Identification Credential Program, the TWIC program. That is um, going to be in force April 15th of 2009 so that individuals who work in an unescorted secure area within a port have an identification biometrically enabled card that they have to have on them and enroll for, have a security uh, check as part of that process. And that document really is uh, useful across the board in identification. So we have looked at the TWIC program, our enforcement with chemical facilities and their security, first responders and how they're documented so that we have appropriate access and controls to an incident management scene, other physical um, critical infrastructures. We are working very closely with the private sector across the board to really have a standard and a framework for identification in those areas, uh, the last key area being federal employees and contractors under what we call the Homeland Security Presidential Directive 12 program or HSPD 12. All of those programs are consistent with or are coming into alignment with uh, a federal standard that we're really pushing out across the board um, through ANSI and through international bodies to have a standard for identification issuance that is at a, at a pretty high level. Um, so we're excited about that process there. I know Stuart Baker talked about cyber security as well. And so this move to identify people and provide credentials that have three-factor authentication is something that translates into that logical world. We have massive challenges with securing, certainly, uh, internet access, secure transactions via the internet, access to um, systems and having that logical control over access to systems. This is going to be a major step forward, certainly for the U.S. government, and something I expect the next administration to continue to, to pursue and, in fact, uh, even speed up in many ways. And lastly, as you talk about the, the major identification card used in the United States, that being the driver's license, we have moved out uh, very quickly in, in, the recent, in the last year with state departments of motor vehicles who issue driver's licenses in this country to continue to enhance the security of the documents that they issue in, in as many ways as possible. It is a costly undertaking. It has been controversial, but at the same time, it is something that's critical and has been recognized um, as an activity that's necessary to move forward as the 9-11 Commission recommended. I think there will be some activity on that uh, in the coming year, and it will be interesting to see where the Real ID Act ends up going, but there's no disagreement about the need to further secure driver's licenses in this country, and we have done a lot to work with the states to start doing that uh, in real ways. So uh, great progress there. That's probably a wrap up on the key programs that are of interest, and I'm excited about the opportunity to speak with you today to give you a little bit of information on where we are in the United States and we will continue to compare notes with our foreign counterparts to make sure that these things align internationally as well.